Did your earthquake in Sendai? Is everything okay? Was everything okay? Yeah, last last month in March. Last month, right? Yeah. Yeah, in February and March, once one 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 month, one time in a month, and and both are were higher than seven, I think. Is it? Is it? Yeah, seven something. But uh, what happened last last month also tsunami um, advisory. But lucky <laughs> ini no big tsunami. Abi pun kan yeah. jam salapan Abi nggak buka dulu orang Jepang ni uh, uh, apa namanya uh, guest lecture <laughs> jadi double lah sekedap. <laughs> the thing is the meeting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nah, no one, no one. The the epicenter is quite close. Uh huh. Something like what happened in Palu. Uh -huh. okay. Epicenter is very close, but uh, luckily no landslide, no no big okay. tsunami. So uh -huh. just they just cancel later, so no damage. That's you, you mean landslide like liquefaction, yeah? Yeah, sometimes it can have make um, liquefaction like Palu. So that's okay. very difficult. And now what? I was in the Sendai two days before the tsunami. <coughs> Oh, on the March 9? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so in that case, you might feel uh, the foreshock? No, 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 no. Uh, before, before. So before two tsunami. Two days, two days before the tsunami, before yes. the, the earthquake. Case, yeah. yeah, but actually we we had a foreshock on the March, uh, I, March 9. I'm not I, sure. I don't really remember, but uh, <laughs> just two days after arriving in Jakarta, I saw in the television... Uh, You know the uh, aircraft uh, flooding, yeah. <laughs> moving in the airport because of the flood of because of the tsunami. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Because there was one foreshock, magnitude seven or something. I see. Just just on the day, uh, on the March nine. Mm -hmm. Maybe you already fly <laughs> in the yeah, airport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> yeah. So at that at that time, there was tsunami warning or advisory, but no tsunami at that time. So I think that's that kind of things is quite tricky. Mm. But the shake was quite strong, but no no tsunami. So just after two days, another big shake, mm. but then very big tsunami. ITB used to have the very uh, well still we have very close collaboration with Tohoku. Uh, mm -hmm. Tohoku used to have the branch office, uh, branch campus office in uh, in ITB. Yes. I think uh, last time, uh, not Bakus, but um, I, I forgot someone sent me a photo of like Tohoku University logo in the Hydraulic Lab. <laughs> Farid, maybe Farid. Maybe Farid, oh, yeah. Oh, Mr. Farid, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and we, we applied a Satrep project. Maybe, yeah, once we know the, if we got selected, we can start our collaboration. We had a Satrap's project. Bagus also a member of the, the project. Okay. Oh, ini ada Pak Lamsah nih. Halo Pak Lamsah, Assalamualaikum. Ini baru pada masuk kali ya? Iya, yeah. baru masuk. Biasa deket-deket jam 9. Ya, yeah, this... Uh, most student uh, join nearly nine o'clock <laughs> yeah I'm, i'm so sorry about the the time <laughs> it's all right i know you're very busy it's quite <laughs> interesting i mean even i'm, I'm familiar because I'm, i'm in i'm from thailand and i'm familiar with the time different yes yeah. <laughs> and also bakus he is studying yeah. in japan and so so we, both of us we very familiar with the time different <laughs> We make wrong calculation. <laughs> What the different to two hours, yeah? Just two Japan. hours, but I, I make it the opposite. I mean yeah. Yeah. Japan yeah. is faster. Earlier, earlier or so earlier. I, yeah. <laughs> we both were <laughs> it was also yeah. part of oh, this uh, seven, yeah, in Tohoku, yeah. Seven. No, eleven. Uh, that's oh, exactly eleven. <laughs> yeah, so when when he when, when first he, he told me about the time i just minus two oh, for my okay. time yeah. and then uh, just, just yesterday i thought hey why is two two i have to do the <laughs> lecture too early in japan and still but I, i was thinking like maybe in ramadan time 
still in Ramadan, right? Yeah, yes, yes. So I in think Ramadan, that, that maybe you try to avoid something in the daytime, so we make it in the daylight early. saving time. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, yeah, luckily that I just realized mm. yesterday. Thank you so much for Adebi, for Edwin, for making the time possible. Okay, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ini ada Pak Arno juga. Wah, oh, ada Pak Damai. Ya. What is the weather like in Sendai right now? Now it's springtime and it's getting warm and mm. so the warm is getting warm and um, it's very quite early for this year. So the Sakura, for example, in Sendai is already past mm, already passed <laughs> yeah very fast yeah, yeah, already, yeah, yeah. Very early, yeah. yeah usually should be around yeah last week bloom when yeah the, it's already bloom two weeks some weeks ago it's very fast okay right now is nine o'clock uh bagaimana pak Irwan we start okay uh Are you ready, Mr. Anawat Supasri? Yes. <laughs> okay, Pak Bagus. Ya, yeah. uh, karena waktunya sudah ini ya, uh, jam 9 ya. Uh, kita mulai saja gitu ya. Ya, nanti mungkin yang lain uh, sambil jalan join ya. Oke. Okay, uh, with respect to Dean Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering, yeah, ITB, Mr. Dr. Edwan Cardena, Secretary of BPSDM, Mr. Insinyur Herman Suroyo, Head of Pusbangkom, Mr. Insinyur Ruhban, Presenter, Mr. Associate Professor, Dr. Anawat Supasri, Moderator, Mr. Dr. Muhammad Bagus Adityawan, yeah, Lecturers, Students, Alumni, and Other Participants, of General Lecture 6. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, today, General Lecture 6 will be held with the title of Tsunami Disasters, Mitigation and Impact on Coastal, River and Estuary that will be given by the presenter, Mr. Associate Professor Dr. Anawat Supasri and the moderator by Mr. Dr. Muhammad Bagus Adityawan. Before the presentation started, Please to Dean Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering ITB, Mr. Dr. Edwan Cardena, to give the opening speech. Please, uh, Mr. Edwan Cardena. Thank you very much, Pa Demi. Good morning to all of you. Uh, before I officially thanks Professor Anawas uh, Supasri, I would like a little bit giving you some introduction about this uh, program. Uh, actually, this master program on uh, water resources management uh, uh, this year is, is a bit uh, special as we have uh, collaboration with uh, our partners uh, from the Ministry of Public Work and Housing. So uh, many students are coming uh, from uh, that ministry. So we actually uh, designed uh, Uh, this uh, curriculum a little bit uh, modified to meet the requirements or the need of the Ministry of the Public uh, Work and uh, Housing. So uh, uh, today I believe that many of the students are coming from uh, that ministry and uh, it is very important for them to have this kind of uh, lectures. We do this almost uh, every week actually and uh, Uh, this morning, uh, we have very honored to have the Professor Anawat Supasri from uh, uh, Toko University. Uh, Toko has been uh, a friend and a partner of ITB for many years. Before I appointed as a dean, I was uh, the director of uh, international cooperation of ITB. So actually, I also involved in the development of cooperation with uh, Toko. I myself, uh, visiting uh, Tohoku University many times as uh, researchers, uh, giving presentation. So a little bit familiar with Sendai as well. So once again, uh, thank you very much, Professor Anawasu Pasri. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure for us 
to have you uh, today giving a lecture, which is a kind of enrichment and very important to this program. And those for the students, I, uh, I hope that you will really uh, uh, enjoy the topic, which is very important, uh, tsunami mitigation, uh, coastal uh, estuary and uh, river. I think this is very important uh, for the program. So without further ado, once again, as uh, on behalf of the faculty, as well as ITB and our colleagues here, uh, thank again uh, to Professor Anawar Supasri for the time that giving to ITB. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's it. Good morning. Pak Demi mute. Ya Pak, masih mute Pak. I'm sorry. Uh, Oke, okay, uh, thank you uh, to Mr. Dr. Edwan Karina for the opening speech. Then for general lecture six, even are left to Mr. Dr. Muhammad Bagus Adityawan as moderator. Please, Mr. Muhammad Bagus Adityawan. Oke, okay, thank you Pak Demi and Pak Edwan for the welcoming uh, speech for the opening. So, uh, before we begin, I would like to introduce you all to uh, Dr. Anawat Supasri. So, Dr. Anawat Supasri is currently an associate professor from uh, Telugu University. So, he graduated from uh, Chua Lung Korn University for his Bachelor of Engineering followed by Master of Engineering in Water Engineering and Management from uh, AIT, Bangkok, Thailand. And finally, he obtained his PhD in Tsunami Engineering from University uh, Japan. So he, uh, he is uh, well involved in tsunami, uh, tsunami fields. So he is also uh, editor for several reputable international journals, such as Coastal Engineering Journal, International Journal of Disaster Risk uh, and Reduction uh, and other international journals. Uh, he also uh, received uh, various uh, awards uh, for his works, uh, for his research. Uh, currently, he is a staff in International Research Institute of Disaster Science, which is a very well-known uh, laboratory in the world for uh, disaster uh, research. He is in Tsunami Engineering Lab. Uh, he specialized in uh, various topics of tsunami, such as uh, tsunami hazard and risk assessment, tsunami engineering, tsunami simulation, uh, tsunami countermeasures, and uh, other things related to tsunami. As for today, we are lucky enough that uh, Dr. Anawat is here uh, to give a lecture. The topic is on tsunami disasters mitigation and impact on coastal river and estuary. I believe that he will uh, deliver his lecture in two parts. The first part is on tsunami mitigation, followed by a brief session of discussion. Uh, the second part uh, is on tsunami impact into coastal estuaries and rivers, followed by another discussion session. So uh, just now I shared uh, his uh, lecture for today, his PDF file for his lecture today in the chat uh, board. So if you have any question later on, you could uh, write your question in the chat board or you could ask uh, Dr. Anawat uh, directly uh, in the discussion session. So to, uh, to, to shorten the time, so I would like to give the time to Dr. Supasri, Dr. Anawat Supasri to begin his lecture. The time is yours, uh, Dr. Anawat. Thank you. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for... Um, introduction and I'm very pleased to to be here um, to have a chance to to give the lecture and share um, information from Japan um, and um, related to uh, mitigation and their impact on the coastal morphology. Um, I'm very glad to see my oh, my old friends um, Bakus and, and Bak Farid as well as you can see from his screen if you if you wonder um, hello <laughs> if you wonder how my buildings or my office looks like you can see the park for its screen. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, as, as mentioned, 
um, by the dean that we we have long collaboration and currently we have applied one um, joint project and if got selected well and that project authority is the leader and we hope that the project will be granted and we can start um, joint collaboration for four or uh, five or six years from now so and today um, i have two hours so i would like to to talk um i'll split into two parts um the first one is about the mid tsunami mitigation in, in japan in general and the second one um, focus on the tsunami intrusion to river the hazards and um, topics related to the, um, the beach morphology with um, coastal change, uh, um, shoreline change regarding to tsunami. So let me um, share my screen, please wait for a while. And let's be this one. Let's share the whole screen. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. Let me um, make it. Okay, I hope it works. So this is the um, my the title, and this picture is taken um, some years ago. Um, this is uh, we call uh Pratong Island which is where we got the big tsunami also in 2004 again ocean tsunami but um different to to others um tsunami affected area in Thailand um which is like a famous um tourism area where we have a lot of um um, hotels and facilities this this island is the only island in Thailand that um well, it is famous for tsunami survey for sediment um, or tsunami um, deposits for paleo tsunami research in Thailand. So I will, because there's less, almost no um, human disturbation. So I will talk about this in, in detail in my second half of this lecture. All right, so let me start. So first, um, talking about Japan and Toku region, I would like to, to start from, from this tsunami, very important. This is the, the oldest um, recorded tsunami in, in our region, we call um, Jokang tsunami in, eight, in the year of 869, which is very old, more than 1000 years ago. So why this is very important because for example, um, we, we have observed uh, from the written record of the, of course, the explosion of the mountain Fuji uh, nearby this event, and also the oldest written record in in, Japan, uh, in the whole Togo region mentioning about this, this tsunami. Of course, um, before 2011 tsunami, we, we know about this tsunami and earthquake but but why even we know this before 2011 but why we still underestimate or why still large um, impact damage happened because um so for example um, when we do the core sampling um coring research to to see the tsunami deposit so you, you, you may imagine when tsunami happens, it, the, the color is, is brown or black, right? Because um, tsunami could um, erode and brought many sands or some particles uh, under the sea bottoms and brought to inland. So that means um, the sand, sand from the sea could, could be transported inland. So this figure shows um, the place where we do the core core survey and the blue dots shows where we found the tsunami sand, the tsunami from 869 from Jokang tsunami sand. And the red line shows where the, the, the link between the, the, the last location that we found the tsunami sand from a thousand years ago. So from this line, we can say that this, this is the situation before 2011. So let's say like 20 years ago, we know this information that um, a thousand years ago, tsunami was um, at least 
penetrate until until this red line but we have no idea when the the sand um, start to fall, fall down and deposit but still water can still go a little bit far and we we could only found this kind of um, sand deposit in Sendai area so that's why at that time 20 years ago we start to think about the earthquake that could happen only around um, Sendai or Miyang prefecture so that's why we um, kind of underestimate the, the size of the earthquake based, based on the limited um, information of the sand deposit. So at, at the second half of my lecture, I will talk a little bit more on, on um, the simulation of, of, of the, the tsunami sand or deposit and the link to the, the beach recovery. But um, I would like to, to, to know, to understand that the, this kind of um, um, coastal perspective in terms of the the tsunami sediment transport is important also for to for to study the paleo tsunami and to understand the the past what happened in the past and the better correction of the, the future of course now it's already happened but at that time if we we could found see more sand deposit in the south or in the north then we can um, extend or add the size of the earthquake, but still very difficult to find this kind of um, sand deposit in, in the north because of the mountainous area. So the second uh, important tsunami was in um, 19, uh, 1611 tsunami. Uh, for those who like um, Japanese manga or animation, maybe you might have heard his name, Date Masamune, he's one of the also famous um, um, samurai in, in that period. And actually, um, he, in, during his period, he, he made a, a great um, reconstruction of Sendai after the tsunami in 1611. So I would like to, to introduce also this, um, what, what he did. So there are three three main um, activities that he, he made after the, the tsunami, which is the, the pine tree, pine forest, and making the artificial river canal and the land use management. So still what he did 400 years ago, um, we still, still very um, good benef benefits to us and, and we could learn a lot from, from what, what has been done in the past. So first, about the the cost of forest of in, in in japan we 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 are not tropical country like indonesia so we we don't have um, mangrove but uh, we have uh, pine trees is quite um uh, famous for um for planting in along the sendai coast as you can see here like like this one um pine forests are located right behind the beach and and you can see, well, the, the, the width of the, the, the tree is about 50 meter to 100, or in some location can be 200 meters. And from this picture, you can see that um, so these trees could survive after the tsunami. And this is a school, and you can see that um, housing, house, houses um, behind uh, the tree, the pine trees, most of them, they were survived still. Or if you see in this map, you can see that uh, the, the red means where the, the buildings were totally washed away, but and the blue shows where the building could survive, like this picture. So you can see that um, in, in this area, there's uh, breakwaters or seawall. So Uh, the damage to the building can be um, mitigated or else. but um, this one oh no, oh no, no break water in front of the, the house but because of the the pine trees that, that helped um, mitigate the, the tsunami impact 
So the second thing is the, the river canal. Well, um, the canal is actually um, has been dig or built for to for the navigation purpose. Sendai is around here, so they they con make this artificial river along the coast just to um, transport for the navigation or transportation of, of rice or yeah. wood. So this this kind of thing is actually if you see by you see this picture, you can see that once the tsunami in 2011 arrived, the the water um, first um, jump or falling into the canals, and and also we there was some some study showing that because of this canal when the the tsunami jumped into this the energy was dissipated and the tsunami velocity is also it decreased because of this canal. And also from the pine tree like this. So you can see clearly from, from this photo that um, because of this um, of, of, obstacle that um, delayed the tsunami arrival time for, for some, some, well, minutes or something like that. So this kind of thing is what uh, helped tsunami. And also the last but not least, um, this is the, the ancient um, tsunami, uh, the map in, in the southern part of Sendai, where you can see that um, the, the yellow box are the, um, the, the village uh, that has been built, newly built after um, 1611 tsunami. You can, and the blue areas are, is the, this in addition, the tsunami flood area of the 2011 tsunami. So you can see that the the, the village built after the 1611 tsunami is actually um, far enough from the sea and actually they are outside of the 2011 tsunami. So actually what I mean is if the this people still I mean, still live in the same area as they was assigned after uh, 400 years ago, they will be safe. But um, because after that new development, people and people start to forget. So they start to build a new living area in village. Like we have a big village around here and also around here and also yeah, along along the coast, there are several villages along the coast that were affected by tsunami. So again, so after the 2011 tsunami, we start to do uh, after ten years, we already make uh, urban planning. So in the danger zone, we ask people not to to live, and we ask them to to move far away. So, but still, it, it is a challenge how, how we can keep this kind of policy until the next generation. So, um, let, let me then, um, yes, so next, the, 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 the situation in general about tsunami in Japan. So, you can see that. Um, we have some uh, earthquake prediction, almost the whole country in Japan. And what we are um, concerned, which is the tsunami in the west of Japan. This is what, what the situation before 2011 in Sendai. So we have like in this one in the west, there are several um, earthquake and tsunami every 100 year, 150 years. And especially now we are very worried about the Tokai earthquake that happened more than 160 years already and, and still um, it probably um, trigger another two more um, earthquakes that, that maybe generate uh, what uh, many nine earthquakes similar to what happened in, in Sendai 10 years ago. So in Japan, how 
how we we make a early earthquake um, warning. So in, in general, we we have many sensors on the countries, and we make use of the different between the the first P wave, primary wave, and the secondary wave, which is P wave has less ground shaking. So once a fee a pre wave um, has been observed, so JMA, the Japan Meteorological Agency, can detect and give the warning before the the shaking um, S wave came. This is what what they did. They started this service in two thousand seven. And for tsunami, um, it's still difficult to make um, simulation real time. So we make a database. I, I believe that um, in Indonesia and other countries, they also have um, similar um, things as well, database. So, so we, we assume earthquake parameters and we pre-simulate tsunami simulation and store as a database. And once earthquake happened, so we, we search in our database what is the most um, similar um, magnitude or um, locations, and we we could release the warning. So it can be um, after uh, since the first development, it takes about twenty minutes, and then now because of some experience of tsunami thirty years twenty years ago, we we have to um, release the first um, information after three minutes. And still apply um, in the case of 2011. So in Japan, Japan, we we have been experienced. For example, uh, in Toku region, we we are experiencing many um, tsunami. As I mentioned, and this is the tsunami height along the, the east coast of Japan. You can see that um, before 2011, in blue. What happened in 1896 and 1933 also caused very high tsunami along the coast of um, Iwate. But in Sendai, even in the past tsunami, it caused very still comparatively low tsunami. So what I mean is um, the people awareness of tsunami is very different in the north or in the south here of in Sendai because we have lack of um, large tsunami experience. That's why um, people have very less awareness as well. The one main reason is because of the location where we have our peninsula here that could help to protect the tsunami in, in the past. So in, in general, um, we, we have many uh, several um, tsunami and we have developed um, different um, tsunami countermeasure based on this um, tsunami as well. So um, it would, would take more time. So please um, have a look later for, for more detail if you want to see. So in, in general, based on this um, background, for, in terms of countermeasure in Japan, what, what we did, I, I would like to use Toku region as an example. So first, like in 1896, so after tsunami, so they just have no idea. So they just moved to high ground. And then just after um, less than 40 years, another tsunami happens again. So they realize that not only high ground, but because tsunami happened quite often. So they start to build some, some seawall in some areas. And after another 30 years, so this time tsunami, was uh, generated by very large earthquake, magnitude nine point five, which is the, the 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 biggest, the largest earthquake recorded in the world. This earthquake um, generated in Chile, and tsunami, big tsunami, tran was travel from from Chile, attack Hawaii, and cross the Pacific Ocean and hit Japan after one day. So at that time, still no regional like Pacific Tsunami Warning Center was just built because of this tsunami. So yes, so without any pre-natural warning like ground shaking, just tsunami arrived. So for the locations where there has no seawall built after Showa tsunami, 
So they understand, they realize, we realize that we need a certain um, size or certain kind of um, structural measures to, to save us or to protect from this kind of tsunami. So since 1960, there were several um, development or construction of structural measures like seawall or breakwaters or flood gates. And there were some, some tsunamis, small tsunami after that. And it proved that this kind of structure can help to protect tsunami. So I heard from my professor, uh, Professor Shuto, that um, the tsunami research, like what we are doing right now, is not so famous during that period because they, they just spent money for um, construction of this kind of concrete structures. But after 1983 or 1993, this tsunami, we, we learned that tsunami could come um, faster and also it can also cause damage to these kind of structural measures. So since then we start to, um, com we have to combine both structural and non-structural measure, measure, for example, the, the land use planning or other warning education, this kind of thing has to be um, in, um, included in their um, tsunami quantum measure. And for the 2011 tsunami, um, why we, we were underestimate the, in terms of warning, because um, as you can see at the moment, at the first, we just after three minutes is the rule of GMA, they, they announced magnitude 9, 9.7. And then once we observe the tsunami in the deep, deep sea, more than three meters, so they increase the magnitude and warning and up to six, six meters tsunami or, or 10 meter in Sendai. And then once tsunami coming more inland uh, near shore, we can observe the tide gauge for more than four meter or scale out. So we, they, the JMA increased their tsunami warning more than 10 meters. And then from after they have more information, they just increase the magnitude, but still already a bit late, uh, already too late for the tsunami already arrived. So as you can see here, the tsunami wave form the water level. Even in the deep sea, you can see that it's already like six, seven meter height of the tsunami. And this, if this tsunami um, approach near shore, it can be two or three or four times higher. So at this point, the JMA can um, revise their tsunami warning level. But why still um, many large tsunami happen? Because um, in general, when, when earthquake happen, we expected the very, in the deep, for example, if happened in a deep region like this, the water surface will change like this. But this time the water, uh, the earthquake still extend to the shallow region like this. So it generate another very short period, but very high tsunami. So it, the two, two waves combine and hit us as well. And also there are some research, research that point out that, that there is possibility of submarine landslide that generate together with this one as well. So this is quite similar to what happened in Palu three years ago, where this kind of submarine landslide gener generated by the earthquake is very difficult to um, predict even on the current um, situation. So as you can see that um, because of this, we, we could not ex um, predict such complicated earthquake. And these figures shows the hazard maps in some locations. So the, the blue areas are the, the expected, the predicted flood area in the hazard map. And the, the red area shows the, the real tsunami penetration by 2011 tsunami. So you can see that in some area, the expected 
um, flat area is quite similar to what show, is shown in Hazard Map, but like in Sendai or in Ishinomaki, um, the total totally um, underestimate. So that's why people in who live um, outside of the Hazard Map area, so they were they didn't evacuate and, and cause a lot of damage. But for now, to to prevent from from this kind of situation, we we have deployed um, many um, sensors, and for example, this one is under un, under C C bottom um, sensors network. So after three minutes, when JMA re released the first um, warning message, these sensors can observe and help detect the tsunami, even non non earthquake tsunami, and can help to improve the accuracies of their tsunami warning in the, in, the, in the future. In terms of one warning um, levels, at the time of 2000, 2011, there was eight levels really um, details. So they increased, uh, they decreased to, to just five levels to make it more simple. And for, and especially if the, the tsunami is very high or magnitude, yeah, if the earthquake magnitude is very high and we expected high tsunami, JMA might not um, announce the number. I mean, like in case of 2011, when, when they announced their, the number, people will, will just compare the, the numbers. Like, okay, if the government said one meter tsunami, three meter tsunami, they would just, oh, okay, I, we have six meter high sea wall before uh, in front of our beach. So we should be safe or something like that. So the, to avoid this kind of um, overlooking um, behavior of people. So they, in some case for a major tsunami, we, they will not announce their, the number of predicted tsunami as well. And recently we also had one, one, one tsunami that um, the, the tsunami is very um, uh, underestimated. So for example, the, the, the epicenter is around here, but the maximum tsunami height was observed here. And, and in, in Japan, and you can see that like in Sendai, but the observed tsunami amplitude, the second wave was higher than the first wave. And from the sim simulation, we, we found that um, because of the, the orientation of the fault, when the wave firstly hit Fukushima and the reflected wave um, was um, coming to Sendai and merged with the first wave in Sendai that caused the second wave higher. This kind of, of thing cannot be um, reproduced in the warning database. So that's why um, JMA at that time, they underestimate the, the tsunami. And because of that, because the epicenter was in Fukushima, so they and they announced the tsunami warning in Fukushima only. But after two hours, they, they changed from a tsunami advisory to tsunami warning in, in Sendai as well, because of the second wave was higher than the first wave. And this is reached 1.4, so which is higher than one meter which is the warning criteria of Japan. So this kind of thing is very um, important also to be known as the limitation of the, the current warning system. And because of the time, I would like to go a little bit faster. Um, in terms of um, evacuation, uh, you can read more in detail if you want, but um, I would just, I would like to, to stress here that even in Shippo in Japan at that time of 2011 tsunami, they didn't only fifth, still not, not everyone in Japan, they, they evacuate after the tsunami. So just 50% of people, they, they start to evacuate because of the, they felt the ground shaking. And 20% of them, they, they, they should evacuate to safe place, but still, 20% they went back home just to see, or to another 20% to try to see the family. 
and um, yeah, the, these are uh, information about like 60% 60 60 of people they evacuate using card and cost traffic jam. And the, the ever ever sorry for the, the, the text here. So the average, um, this 10 of people using evacuate using the but evacuate by walk is 500 meters, and people who use car they, if they, they feel that the distance is more than two kilometers. This kind of thing can be used for your evacuation planning in the future as well. And from the, from the survey, they, they found that for both people who could survive, they, they use 19 minutes after earthquake to, to evacuate. But for those who were killed by tsunami, they, in average, they use 21 minutes. So it, it, in average, it's just two minutes different, but you can see that these two minutes is very important to, to save your life. So evacuate faster is, is it's very important. And there are some um, learn, um, lessons from, from the tsunami as well. Like the, there are one school here, really close to Sendai Station. In terms of the planning, they, they have store many, um, they have store some certain of food or blanket, but because the school is really close to Sendai Station, so they didn't expect that uh, business, this business or tourist, tourist that will, they might evacuate to that school. So the school is very crowded. So you can think of if the COVID-19 pandemic right now, we cannot allow or accept people evacuate like this. So this is a very um, important issue that you have to um, estimate number of um, possible XKV, not only people around you, but if you are near a business area. And, like this school is safe many people, but because we have very high sea wall at that time, six meter. So once the water, once tsunami over top the sea wall, the water cannot going back to the sea because the sea wall is still there. So these people, even though they survived, but they were stuck in the school for almost two, two or three days. So of course, a helicopter can come and help, but um, really limited number of passengers for one time. So most of people in the school, they were, they have to be, they have to wait for a few days and they have to be rescued like this. And also in terms of evacuation drills, um, this is one of the sad um, example that um, just one week before there's the big tsunami, they make um, the drill, but because there are many old people, so they, they decided to make um, the destination for the drill here in this building, which is in the city, the town center, which is the, cent the town's office. Uh, actually, they have many safe place in the hill, but because of just a drill and they thought, okay, old people may be difficult to, to be gathered. So in the drill. So after one week, when the real tsunami happened, uh, old people, they just follow the, what they did in the drill one week ago. And they, they went to this building and you can, as you can see from this picture, so many of them, they were killed by tsunami. So that's a very sad example. So I would like to stress here, stress here that even in the drill, please um, make it um, as real as possible. So this kind of thing might will not be happening again. And another lesson is that, um, like this one in the has a map, the dots shows the the where the dead body found the the location of the, what they found the dead body. So you can see that they are outside of the hazard map. So that means people, they stick their mind awareness, they stick it into the hazard map. So they just evacuate from near shore to just outside hazard map or people who were inside outside hazard map, they didn't evacuate. So this kind of thing that people, they, their mind, they stick into hazard map. So yeah, this kind of um, education method is really important to, to, to teach people that, of course, hazard map is built based on the current understanding of scientific, but um, it can be higher than this. So we have to, to be um, um, 
think about how to 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 educate the, the people so in japan we we have a lot of um tsunami that's why we 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 have we explain lots of the um structures so in general as i mentioned we have like the breakwaters or we have flat flat gate we have a sea wall like this and or or the pine tree these these are photos um, before the 2011 tsunami so they they were all um destroyed but like in sea here or the black water and floodgate they this they repair they start to repair again so in general they after tsunami in japan we we have an idea a new idea to 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 design the height of of these structures so the first tsunami level ones mean the the tsunami that um frequently happen so within like every 100 year for example small to moderate tsunami so we decide the height of of the structure to protect to fully protect this tsunami but the um, level two mean like what happened in 2011 tsunami so we allow tsunami to be overflow but um, we have to build this um, structure behind the the once overflow the structure should be should still be there no, no damage so there are many research that um, study how to make it this one become strong so based on this this idea so we, we don't have to be very high sea wall we will just the the height sea wall or structure just to to protect the frequent tsunami and if very high tsunami like 2004 the ocean tsunami so it, we just let them over top but we we make sure that we have enough um, um evacuation plan so based on these things we we decide the the height of the wall of course um the yellow dots show the, the actual tsunami height 2011 but based on this tsunami one and level one and two level two idea so we we just increase the the sea wall for example in Sendai, we only increase the height from six to seven meters and i think this is my my last slide for the first part so based on this criteria and, and in general how this is how we we rebuilt um toku um, region so like the place in in sendai we, we are very flat so maybe if you see these figures you can see that this is very flat so water can just penetrate and at that time tsunami could go as far as four or five kilometers so to prevent tsunami in that flat area so we have to build sea wall and make use of combination of many layers we call multi multi layers countermeasure at that time we already have sea wall we have already pine trees we already have the the expressway so now the sendai city already built another road um six meter high elevated road to, in order to be um, another um, layer to to block tsunami so we do many simulations by changing the height of elevated road and to to see what is the best um, tsunami height uh, height of the, the road so that even the tsunami come and over top the road the water the tsunami flow depth still less than two meters so that it would not cause the damage here um one one of my one of study with my colleagues in mandaje they also apply this idea to to create the elevated road um, as a plan to reduce the traffic on the normal life and also can be helped for the tsunami mitigation as well but for those mountainous area they they have to make use of their the but topography so they they ask people to live on the high ground and so that when tsunami arrived so it would just destroy the business area but people still save life so yes so i i think i will stop here at the first half so i believe that although the time is very short but i believe that you understand um in general um the the background of 
tsunami and earthquake in Toku region in Japan, and how people in Japan, especially in Toku, Tohoku area, we adapt and we built the countermeasure, not only structure, but um, non-structural measures in general. Okay, thank you. I will stop here for the first half. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anwat, for the very interesting lecture. So, so many, uh, so many lessons to be learned from historical uh, tsunami, right? So, especially mm -hmm. for in terms of uh, mitigation, uh, future mitigation. So, uh, I would like to open uh, the floor for questions from the audience. Are there anyone who would like to ask uh, related to the topic that was just being delivered by Dr. Anawat? You could write on the chat board or you could ask directly. Uh, you could use any language that you want and we'll make sure that Dr. Anawat could understand your questions. Yes, you can ask in, in Japanese. Good yes. morning, Pak Bagus. Good morning, uh, Dr. Anawat. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. yeah, okay. So uh, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Hello, uh, Dr. Anawat, how are you? It's really yes. nice to have you here. It seems like uh, maybe... Uh, 10, 10, 10 years we in the, in the <laughs> last time we did it. Yes, long time no see. Yes, yeah, long, time, long time no see. Yes, yes, I remember. Yeah, okay. So, first, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. So, sorry that I cannot open my camera because there is a technical problem here. Okay. So, uh, uh, regarding your presentation, you mentioned about the people live in a coastal area and in yeah. terms of uh, tsunami even if they don't have any, how to say, um, awareness about the hazard, I believe that it will be very difficult to relocate the people. And one of the instant method to mitigate natural hazard in coastal area is by constructing the giant seawall, like you uh, mentioned previously. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I ever watched the video after the tsunami uh, 2011 that Japanese government built seawall in some uh, of their coastal area, including in the Sendai coastal. Uh, however, uh, people didn't feel happy about that. They think <laughs> yeah. that by building the seawall like a giant construction over the coast, it can keep away children from the sea. So the children cannot play in the beach, like uh, something like that. And uh, because of the uh, dimension, uh, people feel afraid about it. And uh, did you ever heard about uh, that issue? And uh, what do yes. you think about that? Yeah, instead, okay. uh, probably there is uh, some uh, uh, another way to mitigate uh, people in a prevention point of view. Thank you, Yeah, Anawad. yeah okay. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, in general, well, it's... They conflicts happens in in respect to the um the construct how to measure so each each local government they have their own um power to decide so this kind of uh, how to say what what we call in English the kind of com compromisation so we have between the government and the local people has to be done by each um cities or, or village and yes um of course in terms of government they would like to build because this kind of is it is their responsibility to save their villagers' life. But on the other hand, like as you have mentioned, that we have um, if big sea wall, it causes many issues, including also environment, environment or um, scenery build. So what as of far as I know, we um, as a not only Tokyo University, but um, it, for as a researcher, they um, the whole government they invite the like NPO or university professor to to involve with this kind of issue. So what they did here, so of course by using the the idea of level one and two as I as I just mentioned, um, to decide what is the the prefer tsunami uh, height of the seawall, for example, then when we got the design plan, we they made many um, workshop. Um, every month or whatever between the the government local government and local people they discuss 
okay, the government wants 10 meter, but the local people might want, okay, five meter is better, something like that. This kind of discussion. Uh, so then finally they can understand, okay, they can agree, okay, what meter is the best for each village. But in Japan, they they quite, I don't know, I, I feel like Japan, they, they quite delighted to and believe to people wise, but sometimes it takes a long time to, to do this. So compared to other countries and for example, when the, the government decide 10 meters, for example, then if tsunami more than 10 meter, it can go one kilometer, for example. But when the people say, okay, I want five meter, so that means tsunami can go more than one kilometer, more, more than they expected. So uh, something like this, they have to revise the simulation. They have to revise the, the new plans again. Or um, when they have decided, okay, here we will make the new road, here we'll make the new wall. But if the, the land is belong to people who already die, or so it's quite difficult to get the permission from the, the owner, something like that. So this kind of thing is very, um, they in Japan, maybe you know that this really takes time, and so that also delay the, the 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 construction. I heard that I I have seen one paper they they compared the uh, the construction in in Turkey and in Japan and in Chile after earthquake and tsunami. I, they said the what what we did in Japan is 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 slow because we of course we need the local um cooperation between government and local people, but if we, it's still very difficult, but if we take it too, too much, so it will slow down the deconstruction. So my, my short answer is that, yes, so we, we there's been some um, problems like that. But we, we, I believe that the government, local government already did their best to make um, workshops or some other ways to, to explain to, to the local people to, to find out so they can finally um, agree with the, the final height of the, the the structures. Okay, thank you for the answer, Dr. Anawa. That's really interesting. Thank you, Baba Good. Hmm, thank you, Vidya. Uh, we do have another yeah. question yeah. in the chat board from yes. uh, Alam Shah Kuniawan. So he yeah. was wondering about uh, temporary business workplace, temporary temporary business workplaces in case uh, that a tsunami happened, which is shown in the last slide. So he was asking, his question was, uh, what sort of parameters they are taking into account with regards to this uh, okay. property? Okay, yeah. So I think, yeah, I was in a rush and I have no time much to explain about this. Um, well, compare, of course, if you are, if we, for the case of very flat area, we have more space. So mostly we, we ask people to move outside or business area so can, can be far and Near near shore can be something like uh five like that, but in the north of the sea shoreline and just some some hundred meters you have mountains already, so the the space is very limited, so that means. We we the our first priority is to save life. So so we we can only like cut mountain and ask people to live in the high high ground. But still, we need to to make business. So we have no choice but to let the business area uh, mainly built in the the lowland uh, near the shoreline. But um, as far as can, I can see from from many areas along the coast right now. Of course, even they built the new business area near the sea, but they make a massive um, land uh, elevation. Like they increase the land elevation like 10 meters. So they make a small hill already and make a big um, new business area over top on the top of that. So if, if small tsunami, so we, we hope that it will not cause the also impact to the business area as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anawat, for the answer. So are there any other uh, questions from the audience who uh, would like to ask uh, Dr. Anawat regarding tsunami mitigation uh, related to his lecture that was just being delivered? 
Excuse me, Mr. Bagus, may I ask a question? Sure, of course. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bagus, and uh, good morning, Mr. Anamat Spasli. Uh, thank you. I'm a student from the graduate program in ITB. Uh, my question is regarding the post-tsunami uh, um, uh, situation, and which uh, in one of the slide is shown that the area, because of the seawall, the tsunami's water is trapped inside the area and it's hampering yeah. the evacuation and helping the, the victim in the first yeah. few days. So what I want to ask is, is there something else being, that being done to prevent this in this future or maybe it's it's a standard procedure in Japan? Thank you. Okay, so yes, it's, um, yeah, so there's no choice because we, we built seawall to protect tsunami, but once it's over top, <laughs> we cannot do it. So, so what what changed is that um, before this tsunami, we we store um, food or some other emergency stuff for one day. But based on this lesson, we we have changed our regulation that okay, we we should store for three days and and yes, because of all these kind of lessons. Of course, I heard in the the in USA, not tsunami, but some some hurricane of flood events that this kind of thing happens and the government the sea will to release the water and cause flood and water cannot retreat back to the sea so the, the government just asks the army to destroy the dike so that the water can go back to the, the river as far as possible, but I, I don't think it can be happening in Japan. But um, yeah, they, they, they also think of how to um, connect between other area to that, to bring the, the pump or something like that to, to reduce the water. Uh, is it okay, uh, uh, Pastor James? Because just now uh, you were breaking up the connection. So I was wondering whether we could, you could, you could understand clearly what, uh, uh, Dr. Anawat said just now. Uh, yes, uh, it's breaking up, but I understand the uh, point of the answer. Thank you, Mr. Bagus. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So uh, we still have, oh, you have so many questions now. <laughs> yeah, I think there's one question in the chat. and another... Yeah, yeah. So okay, from okay. Arianti, Carlina, Nuren, Diastuti. So probably this would be the last uh, question for this session before we move on to the next section. So uh, Arianti, Carlina, Nuren, Diastuti asked you about how to predict and simulate modeling, uh, especially if it's caused by uh, earthquake landslide, landslide. So yeah, I was wondering about that too, because recently in Palu, we had a uh, landslide uh, induced tsunami, right? So uh, he was wondering, uh, how to simulate uh, the model for tsunami wave caused by landslide, especially the reflective the reflected waves that could happen, and what's the best type of modeling uh, that we can do to educate the people out there in case of mitigation. I think uh, she was referring to. Okay. Uh, mm. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, actually, we also have another model that we consider. Um, tsunami simulation for two, two we call two layers model, which is the, because of the water layer and the soil layer. So we, we apply that um, uh, model to, to simulate the Palu tsunami. And The Kakatau in Sunda. Uh, for the future prediction, currently we also develop, we are applying um, the slope stability analysis, which is the what, what they are doing for the soy, soy mechanics people. <laughs> so we apply the stop, slope stability model to, to Palu Bay. And from the soy parameters that we can estimate or predict where the slope failure can be happen. And we input this, the slope stability result to tsunami simulation. And we can, for Palu case from the Palu data, we can somehow prove that, okay, our method can, can show a good um, 
yeah, um, reproduction of the landslide area. So oh, that, that can be used in the future, but keep in mind that to do this is very um, simulation cost consuming. So of course, if we just talk about Palu, we can, okay, fix the area and change parameter and see something like that. But if you talk about the whole Ind Ind Indonesian many islands, and uh, the, the area is very big, so it's still very difficult for, for this. And for the, in terms of warning as well, it's, it's still very important for difficult for, for warning. So of course, the, but landslide is really happen without any trigger. So I, I still would like to say if, okay, if earthquake happens, it, no matter what um, strike sleep or deep sleep, just evacuate as far as possible. That's still the only thing that, that we can say. And about the reflected wave, um, I think the second question is about deflected wave. Yes, because of the 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 problem that I show in my slide, it, it was because um, the cover the JMA did, did not um, expect that kind of forty five degrees um, orientation, and also because of the database, we cannot make like very small grids, like ten meters or five meter resolution of the grid. So that's kind of the, the limitation of the database of using the large um, simulation grid. But in general, any, any tsunami model, if you have a good um, resolution and if you have a good um, earthquake for parameters predicted, so this kind of thing can be um, solved, in my opinion. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Anawat, for uh, the very interesting lecture, part one, just now. So probably, uh, is it okay if we move on to your part two of your lecture, or you need some time? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I can continue. So, uh, okay. please, the time is yours for the second part of your lecture. Yes, sure. So similarly, I, 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 I probably stopped at um yeah after 30 or 40 minutes and allow you another 10 or 15 minutes for the question okay okay so let okay let me so this one hopefully it looks okay oh I have to jump to this page Yes, yeah, so actually this, oh, the tsunami penetration to river is actually mainly done by um, a Bakus professor. <laughs> so I, this also, this slide also, some, some of the slides, they're also from the special TV program made by NHK and um, they interview uh, Professor Tanaka, which is a uh, focus for uh, advisor. So, and so for today, from now, I would like just to pick up some um, interesting um, topics related to the tsunami in river and related to the morphology change by tsunami. So for more detail, I, I hope that you can learn more and how how to, to simulate tsunami in the river or the in the simulation part. But for now, I would like to just to introduce you um everything in, in general and how in the future, if you would like, how, how you can apply this kind of study or lessons or model into your own research in the future. So I took some some um pictures from the NHK program. That is very uh, interesting and, and easy to, to, to follow. So again, um, we, we go back 10 years ago about the situation of 2011 tsunami, which penetrate up to 49 kilometers inland along the river. It's very, very long. And of course, at the point of 40, 50 kilometers, there was no damage, but still, the damage to house or shoreline still could be observed up to 12 kilometers from the sea. So this is one of the, this is the, the river that, that this, um, uh, the TV program has mentioned. When the tsunami arrived after 40 minutes after the earthquake, and because of the very large tsunami, um, they expect 
this amount of the water discharge in the river, which is equal to about 600 times of the of discharge compared to the normal, normal period. And uh, the flow, flow velocity of for 40 kilometers per second, which is like a motorcycle or 1.5 meter faster than the tsunami flow inland. So, so as so as you can see here, it's not only people who live in along along the, the shore, but along the, the river also very important and, and dangerous for cause for people who live along the river. Of course, in Japan we have quite high um, river dike as well, but most of in many of um, rivers along the tsunami hard, hardly attacked area. The, the tsunami flow in, in, in the river was higher than the dike and overflow and caused damage similar to this river. And um, this photo is taken after another tsunami in, in Sendai five years ago in 2016. The river is here along this. We have Sendai port, one of the, the most important economic area in Sendai here. And from the helicopter, we also observe tsunami penetrate in the river. Um, but um, luckily at that time, there was no, uh, the tsunami was small and no, no overflow by, by this tsunami, so we were lucky. So as you can see here, in terms of research in the future, um, as you know that um, tsunami is actually long wave. So we, we use uh, kind of the linear long wave um, equations to, to, to simulate the, the tsunami. But um, as you can see here, um, once it's penetrate to the, the river, the, the wave period is rather short. So we, of course, in, if we just apply the, the similar tsunami simulation and, and just if you have very detailed topography data that could reproduce the, the width of the river in your topography data, that, that could be a, a, a one possibility. But if you would like to um, apply or, or re really simulate tsunami in a river focusing on the river entrance only, you need another um, set of um, simulation for that. And because tsunami coming from, from river, as you can see in the same area, but this is a situation of 2011. Um, you can see that tsunami both arrived from both um, from the sea and from the river. So like people in, in this area, they were they have no, no place to, to escape as because the tsunami was merged from the over top from the river and, and from the sea. This um, simulation result is more um, understandable. Um, this is on a, also 2011 tsunami, but um, in another area where you can see that, oh, sorry, I forgot to make um, this translation here. This is mean the press when the water, imagine that uh, maybe this one is better. So when the water, when tsunami comes and there's a build, many buildings here. If the building still stands, so water can go through the, the space between the, the building and increase the velocity. So like this, in this simulation, you can see that um, the dark, uh, dark rate, the more rate means more um, higher flow velocity. So you can see that uh, in among the space, the, the road where we have uh, between the, the buildings, the flow velocity is getting high. And this is a big river here. So tsunami can flow faster in the river. And once it overflow over top the, the river dike, tsunami also penetrate on the other side. So this kind of issue happens in many places in, in Toku region as well, where people who live far away from the sea and actually they expected tsunami coming 
okay, they got warning, so they expected tsunami coming from the seaside. But many of them, they, 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 for the eyewitness, for example, they said they, they saw tsunami from the, from the riverside, so non seaside like this, and and at some point tsunami merged together and caused higher tsunami here. So just to make a summary, so we 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 call city type tsunami, which is first um, when tsunami hit the city area. It's uh, was pressed and getting higher speed among the building, and then from from the river as well tsunami go faster and overtop the, the the river dike, and then merge here and destroy the buildings and become debit debit flow. So together with debit flow and similar to what I I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture that um. The, the it's not only tsunami, but you can see here the debris or the sand deposit can also flow together with tsunami. So because of this, um, we apply from now we, we, we have the modeling technique using sediment transport modeling. And if you remember my first slide, I talked about the tsunami 1000 years ago, we can see that, okay, now it's a, um, we re-simulate the tsunami and we found that, okay, at the, the, the last point that we found the sand deposit, the tsunami flow depth is still more than one meter or the flow velocity is more than one point something meter per second. So by doing this, we can also estimate the relationship between the, the sand deposit and the tsunami characteristics. But as, as I mentioned here, we, we still need to, um, to consider not only water, but, but the debris and the, the sand sediments. So uh, my, one of my colleagues, he, he combined, so not only tsunami simulation, but the the sediment transport, which is the sand and the debris flow together in one model, trying to, to explain the situation in the real situation. So maybe, yeah, so I can, can skip this one. So again, so we, uh, we have our in-house um, tsunami simulation um, to tsunami model and we have the tsunami uh, debris flow. For example, this one they can represent the represent the the flow of the 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 boat floating debris, and also we have another the model that um, simulate the sediment transport. So my colleague he um, combined these two models into the typical tsunami simulation. So let me um, stop my share screen and I, let me show one tsunami um, CG so that you can understand more um, a little bit about the how the simulation works. Please give me some, I forgot to open the, the folder. So this is the simulation. Okay, let me um, share my screen again. Oh, sorry, it's not this one. It is this one. I hope you can see my animation. So let me start again. So this is the Kisinuma city um, where you can see um, the clock here. This is almost half, half an hour, uh, 24 hours after the tsunami. And the, the white show the boat, fishing boats on some ships. And uh, you see the flow speed color bar here and the, the suspended load, which is the sediment transport um, amount here. 
in Kesenuma, and we have rivers here and the bay inside like this. So you can see that because of the, the width of the bay is getting small here, so the water concentrated here and flow velocity becoming become high and start to um, um, erode erode the sea bottom and cause a large sediments um, coming into the, the city. This thing can also the same thing happens in in the river as well, and you can see that from the model can also mod uh, simulate the, the flow of, of the, the the boat as well then the water recede back to the sea at some point here you can see that the sediment also were brought back to the sea as well because of the gravity the back to the sea and for, so this this kind of things can can be implemented in the model and we can um of course we, we can use this to to explain the situation but and on the other hand we can use this kind of model to to um, predict um, what will be happen also in the future and we we also found that this kind of um, sediment um, transport will increase the, the damage to the buildings and also um, it depends on the uh, the we also related to the beach recovery that I will explain um, later on as well. And this is another issue that um, we, we keep talking about this um, after 2011 tsunami. Sorry, this is not about the tsunami in the river, but when we talk about the sediment, um, as you can see here, that the water is, is black, that contain many um, particles, sands and other um, dangerous particles. So for, for those survivor who somehow drank um, tsunami water, so they saw that the this kind of harmful substance were store in their lung and it, it caused um, long-term health risks. So in, in terms of medical science, we have professor who also study this kind of um, long-term health impact by tsunami as well. So um, in terms of the recovery uh, or impact to, of, of tsunami from, to the um, morphological uh, process, I would like to use one example that my previous student applied to, to Thailand using our um, sediment transport model. So in, in Japan, as you can see here from the satellite image, um, this is before tsunami. And just after 2011 tsunami, you can see large um, erosion here. And still after uh, two, some years and even right now, without um, human intervention, it still takes time for the beach to be recovered by nat natural um, condition. But um, in our study area in, in Thailand, for example, before it's like this, and after, right after tsunami, it's a large um, erosion, but just after one year, it's already recovered. So we would like to understand the, the recovering process why this this kind of um, process is this different even though the this these two tsunami they the wave was very big and also um it they, they are both very um shallow 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 water area i mean from yeah so so even though the similar tsunami types and similar um, bathymetry, shallow sea, but why it caused different um, characteristic of the recover. So we, at that time, together with my student, we, we, we choose um, this study area to try to explain the, the beach recovery and the, 
the recover uh, the re recovery process. Um, so in general, of course, and we we are we for us we we are not we we are not sediment uh, long wave sediment transport model, but we we apply the sediment simulation and sediment transport model to our study area. So in general. We use the topography before tsunami, and then when tsunami happened, it caused the short-term morphological change. And um, uh, of course, if 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 we have uh, uh, wind waves um, generated sediment transport model, it will be good, even be better to to in, uh, explain the situation for the recovery but at that time at this point we only focus on the, the first issues so as i mentioned we we found that um the, the beach could um, recover very fast after one year and so in general we apply the one of the famous um sediment transport models proposed uh in 1999, so we we assume the um, uh, two two layers of the the sediments, which is the bed load and the sus suspended load, and so we it can be the the change the change between the, the two layer we allow the sediment can be moved from bed load to the suspended load as well, depending on the the setting uh, velocities. And I would like, I would not um, explain much in detail, but yes, just uh, in general, we, we consider uh, many parameters um, related to the, the sand or sediments, mainly, for example, the, the shield parameter settling velocity so that uh, the velocity of the sand to be setting down to the another um, layers. And one of the another important Parameter is the, the screen diameter or the size of the sand using the this model. Of course, um, in many er in many area, um, the sediment is very small, so this model cannot be applied for the um, clay. We the, he has been he has developed another model for the the clay or smaller particle as well. So we apply this kind of sediment transport model to. To Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean tsunami, and focusing on this um, island to understand the, uh, to re reproduce the the beach, beach erosion, or coastal uh, morphological change in, in this area. And of course, before that, we we simulate the, the tsunami, and we found that um, our Indian Ocean area and tsunami height is kind of um, acceptable. And um, I think I have seen uh, a movie here. So you can see the left figure is the tsunami height and the right one is the sediment concentration. So you can see here when the water tsunami arrived and okay, maybe it's too fast. I will try again. So, okay, let me stop. The blue means the less concentration and red more red mean more um, sediment concentration in the study area. So you can see that at first when tsunami right, it caused uh, um, erod here in the near, near shore area and move in inland like this. And then from the retreated wave, Tsunami moved back to the sea and brought the sediment back to the sea in the shallow area, like this. Of course, this is the example in the along the shore, but um, it's also cause similar um, characters in in the in the river where the tsunami can be concentrated and and increase the the velocity and sediments similar to the previous animation that I have just shown in a bay. So by doing this, uh, we also could um, reproduce the situation by using the sediment transport model that the, the actual um, uh, satellite image of the tsunami here and our simulation result is shown in, in red as well. 
So by doing this, we can also um, simulate the, the thickness of the sand deposit. The, the x axis is the distance from the shoreline and the y axis is the, the thickness of the deposit or the sand. So we can compare the what we can simulate from the simulation and also from the real observation. And from the accumulation of the, the sand sediment, yeah, we have a good agreement as well. And it comes to the point why we, um, how can we make use of the simulation result to explain the, the situation? So we can see that when the, uh, since the earthquake happened, when the first tsunami arrived with a very high tsunami height. So after that, the when the retreat receding wave happened, it could uh, erode the, the beach and very, cause very high sediment concentration. And but however, there was no big change of the sea of the land elevation after the second or third or fourth or fifth um, waves. So there, there are two questions at this point, why um, there was no erosion uh, during the first incoming wave like this, this one, the wave, has, the wave was very high, but why no erosion observed during this point? Or second, where, where, where were this eroded sand during the receding wave? You can see the um, erosion here, but where, where are they? So to answer this, we make um, one, one dimension tsunami simulation, trying to understand or reproduce the, the situation. So you can see here, um, when the water start to retreat and, and attack the, the shore, um, actually the erosion start to happen and it caused very um, high, um, Con concentration of the sand because super set is, is very super saturated. So in, in a model or in a reality, uh, in a model, yes. So when the, the in a model we set as when the, the sub concentration is very high, so it's already saturated. So no more um, scouring or erode can be happen. So that's why even though the tsunami was so high, but um, no, no more um, eroded sand. So it's the ero erosion stopped by the program here. And um, when after the big wave, when the water start to retreat back to the sea, we, we can see here or similar to the, um, the simulation animation that the water, uh, the sand is actually um, eroded ah, the deposit here, which is in the shallow area. So that means, or or if you see this this figure, this this is show this show the the final simulation result. Um, the showing the 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 thickness of the sand after the tsunami simulation, you can see that large um, sand were actually um, deposit or when from the receded wave, they were deposit near the near shore area. So from the simulation, we, we assume that the, um, the sand is actually uh, moved back to the sea in a very shallow region. So after this, the um, by the normal wind can or sediment transport in a normal process can be easily um, help to, to brought the, the sand deposit in the, the shallow region back to the coast, coastline and make and contribute to the fast, fast um, beach recovery process. After this, actually, we, we have been doing some more study to understand about the tsunami height or wave period uh, that refer to the um, uh, the erosion of, of the tsunami. So it, if you would like to see more in detail, but still in Japanese, but yeah, I, I would like to, I can also find the, the paper and share it to you in, in the future.
So yeah, so in general, even though um, we, <clears throat> we just start to apply this kind of sediment transport in, 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 in many um, study areas, but um, at least by using this kind of sediment transport can be helped to understand the, the paleo tsunami, tsunami in the past, and also to, to resolve, to solve some underestimation of tsunami force. And also, yeah, of course, uh, kind of future, if you apply these things, simulation for future, we can also think about the, like if you have many factories in your study area, you can think of the long-term health risk that can be impact, or this is similar to, to your, your class right now. This is the... recovery or uh, custom of morphology, of course, we produce the erosion or deposition process or um, predict um, what can be happen um, in the future. So um, for my last slide, I would like to, to end up with the, um, um, the this kind of activities. We, I'm not sure if, if you know about this. Um, since 2016, we uh Japanese government they proposed to the UN um, disaster for this reduction UNDR um, to promote the the 5th November to be the World Tsunami Awareness Day every year so UN or any uh, support from Japanese government they they try to encourage or increase the tsunami um, awareness um, at least once a year to make many activities I am also helping the Um, also my Indonesian colleagues that we tried. So the this why why it has to be the 5th November was there was a big um, earthquake in 1854 and this guy he's the village leaders and he he noticed that the big tsunami might come after a big shake so he was still difficult to convince his villagers to evacuate after tsunami so he put fire on his um, rice um, stories in the high high ground and let people um, evacuate from um, near shore to the to the hill and, and he could save people many of his villager life so that this this kind of very brave story and after that he also spent his own money to build um, a dike a seawall earth soil seawall like this and this seawall could help save people once again from the tsunami in 1946. So based on his brave um, action on that, for the tsunami that happened on 1854. So yeah, that's the, the background why uh, we start to um, propose the, the day. So yeah, so from second half, I I, I mainly introduce about the, um, how to apply the sediment transport model to um, understand the, situation of the morphological change uh, for the erosion and, and deposition, but it can also be used for the future prediction. And at uh, and, and the beginning, I also introduced the lessons from the 2011, from the tsunami intrusion to the river um, that we used to um, underestimate the hazard from tsunami in the river. And of course, yes, for the future, perspective by studying tsunami coming into the river alone that will be very also important for um, study under estimate hazard for people who live far from the sea but near along the few uh, the river that can be also um, affected by the large tsunami as well okay i i, I give you another uh, 10 or 15 minutes for the question and, and discussion thank you Thank you, Dr. Anawat. So, uh, are there uh, anyone from the audience, students, colleagues, or friends who would like to ask question? It's a very interesting uh, lecture that you gave just now. So, yeah, about tsunami modeling, uh, especially related to sediment transport. 
Are there any questions from the audience? Or, well, if you want, you can ask questions related to the first half as well. Let's... Yeah, mm -hmm. related to the first half or the second half. So while we're waiting for questions from the audience, so I was a bit uh, intrigued with your, the simulation for the city tsunami. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, uh, what's the minimum grid size or the, how to say, mm -hmm. of, uh, yeah. kind of simulation? Because you have to model the narrow street, right? Or yeah, yeah. Find no special techniques for that. No, actually, no. Uh, at that time, we we use five meter, five meter grid. So it it is small enough to capture. Um, the yeah, the, the road width. But um, for the buildings, we at, at the, for the simulation, I I I believe that we we model buildings. I mean. Of course, we use Manning roughness coefficient, but we have some question to, to modify the Manning roughness coefficient based on the, the density of building in, in the grid. So more, more building, we can calculate as a ratio of buildings uh, area in the grid area. So, or we, we, we add the building height in the, in the topography. But in some, but for some simulation that we we have no uh, small uh, resolution, we we use we assume in the simulation. I mean, for for example, seawall, uh, we assume seawall as a line uh -huh. in, in the simulation. Just uh -huh. okay if the virtual line in the simulation, if the tsunami hit uh, reach this. Grid is we we set as like ten meter <laughs> virtual line in the simulation as a sea wall something like that. Okay, thank you. I have a question here, but it's a direct message to me. So, uh, uh, she was wondering from uh, Kairu Nisa. So she was wondering how to decide to build a structure such as sea wall to reduce the the danger of tsunami. So. Uh, the how to say uh, decision decision factors for for building a tsunami uh, seawall, and then uh, earthquake and tsunami both are uh, difficult to predict where and when. So, uh, do you think uh, how to say you build a tsunami wall, but suddenly you build it here, but then uh, the tsunami occur in other places and that kind of thing? So, how you decide which one is more important? which area is more important to protect or to build the tsunami wall in? Okay, so back to my previous um, talk, I mentioned about tsunami level one and level two. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's still the basic um, criteria of how to decide uh, the height of the tsunami or, mm -hmm. the, uh, or the importance of, of having the, the, the sea wall. So, so we we check first. Okay, what happened in the past? If we, what is the frequent tsunami and what is the low frequent tsunami? So then we decide the height of level one and level two. But um, yeah, similar to the question, I think from from Vidya, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so the people claim that okay, why you have? Of course, we have this scientific. Um, idea level one level two but once you build the wall already but still um how say in english the depopulated less less people after the, the, the tsunami so like we build build big sea wall but no one to protect people already move somewhere already they don't, they don't want to come back to the i think it's it's, it's probably in, in japan i mean if like in Andate or in Palu, I think people still come back to in the same place. But in Japan, the gap between the capital city and the rural area is getting worse and worse. So yeah, so this gap is very big. So still very difficult. And of course the government has to spend the, the reconstruction related money by the, the, the government said as 10 year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that kind of thing is uh well it's not it's not difficult, it's quite difficult to to judge, but um it's like uh to build a wall is like um it's tangible, 
is what you can see as a symbol of the construction. And you have to use by the, the, the period of 10 years. So that's to see wall um so if, but in the in toku region but the the main earthquake area is ex expected around aomori or hokkaido in the north of japan but still the, the because of the size of the earthquake magnitude 9 and size of tsunami can still very high so that the inundation area and height is more or less similar to what happened in 2011 so but now the government has released a new hazard map, but at that time they, they consider that, okay, even we built a new seawall, but um, in that at current situation, we, they, in the simulation, they decide that when the wave hit the wall, the wall will be destroyed and allow people, uh, allow water to penetrate inland. So like a worst case. So we can see that the simulation, uh, the inundation area in the new hazard map is quite still similar to what happened in 2011. But um, as a local government or local people, they said like, why we, we already spent a lot of money after 10 years to uh, mitigate or build many structures. So now each prefecture, local government, they do another simulation by taking consider uh, the sea wall, sea wall still stands, still no, no broken <laughs> after tsunami. Impact from the new, so we're looking, I mean, oh, new big tsunami, but the flood very very small so people might not evacuate than they expected so it depends on how you explain the the simulation result to the local people so i think as a if yeah because i believe that most of your students they're from their government so of course same same results same data but yeah it's very um important how to to convey this um, scientific result to the local people Okay, thank you. So are there any other questions from uh, students, colleagues, or friends who attend this lecture? I do have one final question though, <laughs> before yeah, sure. I end this before session. I my, yeah, okay, yeah. So I was, uh, you, you explained just now about level, level one and level two for tsunami, uh, tsunami classification in order to develop a seawall. So in that sense, uh, if we, how to say if we have a tsunami level two, that means that there are no countermeasures. Is that is that correct? So you just need to run away as soon as possible to a safe place, in that sense. And uh, how to say so? For example, if you have like a very important structure in the in the coastal vicinity, such as airport, so the design for the airport itself is based on level one. But in case of level two, then everyone just should go out from the airport. So correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, could you elaborate more about it? And the next question probably is about uh, what is the relation between the tsunami level one and level two? And the other one, you have like five, five, how to say five, five classification for tsunami wave height. Are there any uh, connection between those two level one and level two and the five classification of tsunami? Oh, that five classification is just for the warning purpose. So it's not related to level one and two. Oh, okay. okay. And level one and two, oh, yes, for level two is just like we allow water to, to overtop, but based on the lesson of 2011, the structure on the backside of the wall got very strong damage. And even the parts of the concrete can also be scaled and float inland that cause damage. And spend there yeah, is so for for level two first is to make strong um, backside of the seawall no no damage after tsunami overtop and also to let 
to save life. So, of course, so the that's why the for example you mentioned about airport, like Sendai Airport, they were survived from the the tsunami because the tsunami um, hit only the first floor and people safe in the second and the third floor. So we keep the same air, uh, same location of the airport and based on this con uh, consideration, we just add one one more one meter more in in the seawall in front of Sendai. So yeah, that's that's how how we we decide. Okay, thank you. Uh, probably we still have one question from a student here, from Pita Lu. Okay, yeah, this will uh, be my last. Uh, yeah, this will be your last yeah. one before, yeah. There's also the brief flow along with the inundation and sediment transport problem. Uh, uh, tsunami, uh, is it possible to simulate to simulate the brief flow using tsunami or other simulation Okay. Program, uh, yeah. Like in the CG that I just show you in Kesenuma, we also couple with the um, baby flow at that time uh, is the uh, fishing uh, kind of boat, boat or ships. At, the, at this moment, we can we can do it. But that but the baby flow like the broken trees, cars or a uh, house or whatever is still very difficult to to simulate we for the term for the baby uh for the we can model like bigger bigger stuff like big board or something like mm -hmm. that like or debris is still still difficult okay. okay thank you so thank, thank you so you. much for the very interesting lectures, both sessions, and thank you all for participating in this uh, lecture for the questions and uh, everything. So before we end this uh, lecture, I would like to give the floor back to Pademi, maybe for closing. Pademi. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Associate Professor Dr. Anawat Supasri yeah, for your uh, presentation and uh, Mr. Dr. Bagus Adityawan uh, as moderator. Uh, we all give uh, you both uh, applause. Thank you very much yeah, for uh, your presentation today. Yeah. Uh, we, have seen to, we have seen together that general lecture six given by Mr. Dr. Anawa Supasri is very interesting with several discussion that describing the eager of participants to how the tsunami phenomenon happens and the tsunami wave propagate from the sea toward the coastal river and estuary and the mitigation that can be done based on the past experience of tsunami events. Thank you for the attendance in the general lecture, Dean, Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering, ITB, Mr. Dr. Edwan Cardena, Head of Pusbangkom, Mr. Insignor Ruban, the lecturer, undergraduate and postgraduate students, alumni, and all participants of General Lecture 6 that have attended this event. Hope this General Lecture 6 that has been held will give benefit and additional insight for us. And of course, our knowledge will be improved and better understanding to the tsunami phenomenon mitigation and the impact of tsunami. At the end, general lecture six is closed by saying wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much all. Terima kasih. Pak Demi, sudah foto session? Pak Demi? Sudah di foto tadi, Pak. Oh, sudah. Oke. Oke. Thank you, Anawad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Yeah, bye. Ya, terima kasih Pak Bagus. Sama-sama, terima kasih Pak Demi, terima kasih ya, semuanya. Mahasiswa juga semuanya, ya. terima kasih.